<laughs> we don't know. I can't get my camera off. Sorry. There we go. <laughs> Shout praises to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with joy. Enter his presence with joyful singing. Acknowledge that the Lord is God. He made us and we belong to him. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give him thanks. Praise his name, for the Lord is good. His loyal love endures, and he is faithful through all generations. Good morning, everyone. I welcome everyone to our, I guess it's a joint English service. I'm Robin Stafford, uh, also known as Mrs. Michael Stafford. Yay! And I am grateful Yay. for that. <laughs> I am grateful to be Mrs. Michael Stafford. I am grateful for this time together. We are living in unprecedented times, and we are blessed to have these online resources to help us continue to meet together. This is our time to worship, and I believe... Our time together will be God honoring and a blessing to each one of us. To begin this worship time, let's start with gratitude. The Bible tells us to enter his gates with thanksgiving. 
So what are you grateful for? Let's pause for a moment of silent reflection and as the church song says, give thanks with a grateful heart. Lord God, we are grateful to you for all that you are and all that you do because you love us. Lord, make room in our hearts and our praise for your presence now and be glorified for you are welcome among your people. In the name of your son, Jesus. Amen. Good morning, Union Church. Um, I just want to share some things about what I'm grateful for. Um, I know it's been, well, probably like a month and a half. I shared, the last time I shared during fellowship time. Um, I will give you that update about the whole uh, car being stolen and all that at the end of service. Um, but in general, I am just so grateful. Um, although that was not a good experience, I'm grateful for these things. And the things that I'm really grateful for right now is um, our health. Um, myself and Keith both working in the healthcare field, I'm grateful that uh, we're still able to work and stay healthy. Um, our kids are healthy. And then my mom, who's 94 at, um, Sakura Gardens, the um, old Cato on Boyle Heights. Um, although she's um, with dementia, uh, she's been able to maintain good health uh, through this pandemic. Uh, none of the residents uh, there have gotten the coronavirus. So the staff are staying healthy and they've done a great job to keep the residents healthy. Uh, of course, they're all elderly, so um, they're at they are at higher risk. So um, because of that, I haven't been able to visit her uh, with myself working with um, coronavirus patients. Um, the director, you know, and I we both feel it's not um, safe for me to come visit her. So that's been hard, but I'm grateful that the staff there are taking good care of her and she's staying healthy. Um, so I think Number one for me right now is um, the ability to be grateful for just the simple things of um, our health, our family, and of course, our uh, friends and family, church family like you guys. So that's what I'm grateful for. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, for me, I think uh, Mike asked me to share too. And I was thinking, like, I think I'm just wanted to share, first of all, just grateful for, of course, our church and how uh, how we responded during these uh, crazy times with the Zoom service and everybody kind of just chipping in. Uh, it's definitely been a blessing. And on top of that, I think uh, for me right now, just I think the women in my life, I'm super grateful for. Uh, Mama Choi, just just always praying for me, you know, and um, just being like a, a spiritual uh, source of strength. And uh, my Alex, I'm grateful for her. Uh, you know, me, gratitude is not my natural disposition. I'm a, my natural disposition is a chronic, chronic, uh, chronic <laughs> complainer. <laughs> Why are you laughing? Chronic, a chronic complainer. I always notice the, the wrong and the negative stuff. Um, and, you know, just her, her kind of excitement towards life, even just everyday things like uh, eating sushi or uh, just always looking for the positive around the corner instead of the negative. Uh, it's just such a blessing, you know? Um, so yeah, I'm grateful for you and your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Michael requested that I share too. So, um, I mean, during this time, I've just been really grateful for my family. I think throughout my whole life, I've always been grateful for my family. And 
I, I do know for different people, family means different things. It could be church family. It could just be friends. You know, it could be your adopted family. Um, it just depends on how you're, you're raised. But for me, my biological family is like pretty incredible. Um, I come from a big family. I was raised by both my parents. I have a lot of siblings and I feel like just my interaction with my family, it's just been a foundation for me because it's people that just get me. I don't have to explain myself. Um, it's just, they, they know me the best. I have all my memories or a lot of my memories with my family. Um, we always have a good time. Even at funerals, we like have a good time, which is, <laughs> you know, for some people it's strange. And then, uh, you know, we were supposed to have a family reunion. Um, in july but due to COVID, that was canceled and i i was excited for randy to go because he's never been to a family reunion but it's literally um it's just one side of my family uh it's my dad's maternal side and it's literally hundreds of people that show up and the energy is just so good and it's i mean when you talk to people even if you don't know them that well and you're just related it's just positive energy and um, recently, Randy got me a 23andMe. Um, and so it, I'm not going to bore you guys with the story because it's pretty long. But I found like a whole other side of my family, which is my dad's paternal side. Um, and it's literally like hundreds more people on that side. And I was contacted by someone this week. And they have a whole nother family reunion that I didn't even know about. And they were inviting me to that. And it's literally like hundreds more people who I'm related to you and who I could share a good time with. So that's what I'm grateful for. It's just, um, it's just my family and knowing that there's people, even though there's hard times, there's people who are rooting for you and who understand you. Hey, Cynthia or Dan. If you're there, we'd love to hear from you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so I'm really grateful that God didn't give up on me. I've been sober for almost five years, four months, and me four years and eight months. And um, he's given me a whole different life, a life where I'm, I'm grateful every day to just uh, the things that he's showing me as my job, by my new friends, um, even restoration in my family with my kids, um, it's, been, it's been really hard getting back into their lives, but he's given them a heart to come back to me. And um, that's what I'm grateful for. So every day it's a joy, every day it's something new. And um, because I know it's not me, because I, I would never have a heart for ministry. This, it, this is not my, like Randy said, it's not my nature. So, um, I know it's God that's put this inside of me. And so that's what I'm grateful for. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm gonna go another direction and say that I'm really grateful today to God for the challenges in my life. You know, the whole world is uh, pretty challenged right now, globally and nationally and locally and in our little church and in my own family. And I just want to say how grateful I am because God puts these challenges into your lives to help you to grow spiritually. And God always, always promises not to give you more than he can handle. And all I can say is God's pushing it just a little bit right now. But I'm grateful again that these challenges are in my life, that I'm meeting them as best as I can with God's help. And I know that when this is all over that we're gonna come out of it better. So thank you God for the challenges and thank you for providing us the solutions. Hi everyone. Mine is gonna be a little longer because I have a reflection to share as well, so. Don't despair, I will end. Um, so um, I'm grateful largely this morning for um, my father. Um, he 
grew up in the segregated South and um, he was, he stood up for civil rights and was, um, faced some opposition for that. Um, but I'm so glad, I'm so glad that he took courage because he didn't pass hatred and fear onto me. He passed that courage onto me. And talking to him now about recent events, he, he can easily get discouraged because he's already been here and he's already fought. And there are so many voices saying, you didn't do anything, nothing has changed. But I told him, well, dad, because you and so many other people fought, we're not fighting for water fountains this time. We're fighting for something bigger and we're able to do that. Um, but that, uh, I'll say that this whole year for me has been a season of deep grieving and deep gratitude for reasons like that. Um, but it did cause me to reflect on uh, what to do with the exhaustion when you're, when you're tired of fighting, when you didn't think the fight would be this long. And so I wrote this, I'm gonna read it off of a paper, so. Um, what do you do when, what do you have left when you have no energy left to be angry? When you are out of tears? When that brick wall of wrong is still there and you can't move it, but everyone around you says keep pushing anyway? Maybe this time, maybe this time, maybe this time. And meanwhile, all creation groans and we ourselves groan for adoption, redemption of our bodies, for freedom. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. We wait. We stick it out and we wait and we pray and we think maybe this time. But we still don't know how to fix it. Maybe this time. But the opposition is too strong. Maybe this time. But the problem is more complex than we ever imagined. Maybe this time. But we're exhausted. But scripture tells us something else about this waiting. It says, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weakness, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the spirit himself makes intercession for us. And how does he do this? Groaning, groanings which cannot be uttered. And God, who knows our hearts and minds, knows the complexities of our problems, knows that he, what he alone can do with it, and knows the end of the story, groans for us. If he can intercede with our pain, let us eagerly await the hope he has promised. Good morning, everyone. Let's pray together. The song we'll be singing is Living Hope. How great the chasm, how great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb In this 
inspiration, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then to the darkness, your loving kindness tore to the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living home. Who could imagine? Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages step down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. The King of kings calls me his own. Beautiful Savior, I am yours forever. Jesus Christ, my Lord. Let's sing hallelujah. Grant us, Lord, God, a vision of your world as your love would have it, a world where the weak are protected and none go hungry or poor, a world where peace is built with justice and justice is guided by love. Give us the inspiration and the courage to build it through Jesus Christ, our Lord. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Carry me. Uh, good morning, everyone. We are going to be singing a song now called Carry Me.
Good morning, everybody. Um, this morning's scripture is taken from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, brother. Appreciate you as my brother. I'm grateful. Uh, I'm grateful for the family of God here at Union Church. I'm grateful uh, for the love that I and my wife have experienced here and I celebrate, I'm grateful for the diversity that we have it is truly unique and, 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 and it's truly the hand of God at work. And perhaps not everyone is indeed grateful. Diversity is challenging. Diversity is beautiful, but diversity can also be unpredictable and that's okay. Uh, I am grateful that the hand of God is here among his people and that Union Church is uh, my spiritual family and, and home. I do want to talk uh, about Romans chapter 8. And, and for those who uh, 
are on their cell phones uh, attending the service. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you. Your presence is known. It is experienced. It is felt. And we thank you that you're with us. I uh, know some of our service will be visual. My apologies. Um, we will keep striving to make sure that there's inclusion for everyone and that we all feel that we are being experienced and seen and felt and, and, and acknowledged as a part of our online community. Um, I, 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 I love Romans 8. I love uh, how Paul is so relatable, right? He's so where we are. Um, and so we're going to go there for a little bit uh, in, in, in just a moment. Most uh, of the time I hear from people, they ask, Mike, how are you doing? Mike, what's going on? Um, be honest, more time, uh, more now than any other time that I can think of, uh, people have reached out to me. What's going on, Mike? How are you, Mike? And yes, a, a number of uh, my white brothers and sisters have reached out, certainly, but it, it, it's people who love me and love my family. And, and, and I really, really appreciate that, right? Because this is a difficult season. This is a difficult time for all of us, amen? I mean, the coronavirus has swept the world. And if you are like me, I mean, I'll just speak for me. Uh, I am groaning inside. I am groaning because of this difficult season that we are living. I watch daily news reports, coronavirus updates, and I see the numbers, and, and, and I make certain that those numbers aren't just numbers, but those numbers are people. The number reflects people, and it's such a profound uh, loss that we all experience. Some of you may very well know people who are now uh, dealing with coronavirus or who perhaps have died. My wife and I know one, a dear friend of mine from college. Uh, we had a chance to talk briefly a, a few months back before all this really started to jump off. Um, we mostly stay in contact with Facebook. His name is Lloyd Porter. Everybody calls him Corn or Corny. <laughs> Uh, short for his middle name, Cornelius. He has died uh, from coronavirus. He was about my age. He was a young, young brother. And uh, it was a gut shot that, that hit me all the way into my soul. This is the season that, we've, that we are in. And, and, and what happened, right? What happened just when we were kind of getting our head around it? Just, just, just when we were understanding the importance of social distancing and self-isolation and, and hygiene is the way to go. You are safer at home. And we were starting to see the line flattening and the people around us in our lives started kind of creeping out with face masks on back into the community just when we perhaps might have had a measure of hope. What happened? We saw two videos, did we not? Those who, who, who recall or, don't, or perhaps did not experience this, in living color, live, real time, the world witnessed two videos. One was in Central Park, a, 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 a young, uh, black man who was a birder. I, I, I think that's the term. I didn't know that term before. He was in, enjoying watching birds in, 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 in Central Park, New York, uh, minding his own business. And then a woman, a, a white lady, we understand her name to be Amy now, Amy Cooper, his name, Christian Cooper. There's no relationship. Christian uh, is African-American. And that's going to be the last time I say that, just let you know for reasons that we can go over if you want to ask. Uh, Christian is a black man. And Amy Cooper 
a white lady was walking her dog, uh, if you could call it walking, I'm not trying to throw nobody under the bus, just revealing what we saw without the leash, which was the, which was the way to do it, which was the order. Everybody knew that, and she knew that. And Christian asked her to leash her dog, or she would need to walk to another portion of the park that was suited and set aside for dogs without a leash. And when we watched Amy literally come on glued in real time. We watched Amy weaponize race, weaponize her privilege in this sense. She said to him and, 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 and also to all of us that she was going, she was going to call the police and report to the police that a black man was threatening her. And then we watched her call 911. And, and, and Amy then turned in an Academy Award nominated performance as her face and her body began to turn and tort and her little dog was trying to get away from her, but she had the dog by the collar and the dog was flailing and trying to get away from her. And she said to the police, come quickly, I am being attacked by a black man. And we groaned, we sank. Many of us thought, no, no, this is not happening. She did not do that. And then we saw another video. Actually, we saw the, the second video first. We watched in horror and sadness as a Minnesota police officer placed a black man we now know as George Floyd in handcuffs behind his back, laying his body on the ground and then for eight minutes, 46 seconds, this white police officer placed his knee on the back of George Floyd's throat. And we all just, just died a little bit inside because we knew we were seeing something that we never thought we would ever see. I don't think it even crossed any of our minds. We were watching a man being killed willfully with intent. And I get all the legal ramifications. Y'all just pour grace over that. I'm not attorney, not judging the case. We watched a man murder a black man in real time, right before our eyes. That was hard, right? But there were three other officers who, who were there, and, and I'm sure like you and like me, everyone wanted them to stop this, to, to turn and, 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 and give George Floyd some support, to stand up in this moment for the victim. Don't be another black man being killed by police. You three, step in and instead they stood kind of like crowd control eight minutes 46 seconds a long time we listened as 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 george was helplessly begging for his life and toward the end he was crying out for help from his dead mom we groaned this is the situation that we find ourselves in. This is where you and I are. And if you're like me, you understand how the simple three word statement, I can't breathe, has become a global anthem for justice. It turned away. I couldn't see anymore. And I felt I can't breathe. Title of my, of, of, of my sermon is, it's like a jungle sometimes. And that's, that's a reference, that's a cultural reference. Many of you who know hip hop culture, hip hop music, you might recognize that reference. I'm going to share it with you in a little bit. 
it's just all crazy, right? It's just feeling so crazy. And we know that people are longing for, for hope. We're, we're, we're literally groaning in our hearts, longing for better, longing for more. Asking the Father, fix this. And so we groan. A friend of mine from high school, uh, his name is Eric, he's a white, white guy, I call him my brother, and he calls me his brother, uh, sent me a text. I, I, I check on these guys all the time. And I sent him a text in the morning, June 9th, hey man, how are you doing, what's going on? I'm praying for you guys. This is hard on everyone. And he replied privately, I'd like to read part of this text to you, if I may. He says, this text is just to you, my brother. I've come to better understand as an equity-minded person how painfully institutional racism has been in black people. I am reminded of shocking moments growing up with you and the guys witnessing racism directed at you, my friend. The old man wearing blackface at our performance at the old folks residence. The country club in Fig Garden incident where the two older white men wondered aloud in the restroom if you were lost while we dressed to perform with the city singers. And watching you respond with calm and grace while I stood by dismayed that this was actually happening in modern times. I am no longer content to sit aside and just use virtue signaling to say I am in solidarity. I'm mobilizing to take action and accept my complicity as part of these larger institutions. He works for a theater department. He works for a regional theatrical uh, program and he begins to then share these initiatives that he is going to immediately enact. He ends with, there is hope, there is light. Much love to you, my brother. I will not be the man I am today. I would not be the man that I am today without you, Mike. Our spirits are groaning and it feels very crazy out there. It literally feels like society, maybe even the earth, maybe all of nature is kind of pulling at the seams, right? So there's this, I'm of the hip hop culture. I love, I love some good hip hop. I'm more of an old school dude because that's when I was growing up and first experiencing it. In 1982, a song uh, came out by a hip hop group from the Bronx called Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. That's how I have to say it. You got to say, and the Furious Five. You can't just say Furious Five. It won't work. It hurts. The chorus of their, of their song has stuck with me all of my life. And I started my sermon, I titled my sermon based on their song. If you will, I'm going to show you about a minute, 12 seconds, and maybe you can pick up within the song the phrase, it's like a jungle sometimes. So I'm now going to share a video. It looks like 1882, just so y'all know in every respect. See if you can pick up some of the phrase, some of the words, some of the lyrics. Makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. Broken glass. Every 
everywhere. People on the stage, you know they just don't care. I can't take the smell, can't take the noise. Got no money to move out, I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back. Junkies in the alley with the baseball bat. I tried to get away, but I couldn't get far. Cause a man with the tow truck repossessed my car. Don't push me, cause I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. <laughs> it's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. There is a, 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 a whole movement that began when we all heard the anthem, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. I felt like the world exploded with a loud, finally, someone is saying and sharing my truth. It's like a jungle sometimes. It makes me wonder how I keep from going under. I believe that the Apostle Paul understands that anthem. It is a cry for help. It is a, it is, it is a cry, a stand for justice. The song is called The Message, and the message went global and created a new hip-hop sound, a, a, a sound of justice, a sound of protesting the injustices of the inner city. It became this, this, this movement, a, a, a protest platform where people who normally are marginalized, and we, and we, we tend to overlook them. That's, that's, that's not so much a personal commentary on you and I. Jesus affirmed that, did he not? A man was on his trip and came upon robbers. They beat him almost to death, laying there on the road, on the major roads, only one really one road, he was there, people coming and going, and they overlooked him. They, they sidestepped him. They, they went on the other side of the road which is a very, very, very dangerous thing to do because the road on the other side was a cliff, certain depth. But they'd rather go all the way around and try to navigate certain depth than stop and deal with the poor man beaten and bruised on the road. So this is a worldwide issue. This is a humanity issue. So I believe Paul the Apostle groans and groaned like you and I did. I love Romans 8 because Romans 7, it's such a powerful reflection of my own heart. And Romans 8 starts with, therefore, I'm using a different link, I'm doing a different version here. Therefore, there is now no condemnation. I love that. I love that. For those who are in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation. It starts with therefore, or in some translations may say, so now, and, and, and my, dad would, my dad would always say, whenever you see something like therefore at the beginning of a statement, you have to immediately wonder, well, what was there before? And so chapter seven ends with the apostle Paul struggling and sh excuse me, sharing his inner struggle. Let me read just a little part of it. If you have your, your Bible or your Bible app out, I'm looking at the, the, the Romans seven down at the bottom, verse 25. So what are you saying, Paul? What was there before there is now no condemnation? Verse 25, thank God, the answer is in Jesus Christ, our Lord. So you see how it is in my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. See, Paul recognized that there's this great battle within him, right? He said, look, I want to serve the Lord. I want to do what is right. I want to do what I know to be right. But I find that I can't. I find that this body is subject to sin and death. 
and he began waging this war that caused him to groan, caused him to feel wretched. Oh, wretched man that I am, I believe the King James says. And he begins wondering, uh, verse, uh, chapter 7, verse 24, who will rescue me? Who will save me? I need to be liberated from this. This, this, this slavery to sin and death, this sinful body of mine, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then he, as, as, as if the Lord speaks to him in, in, in his spirit, we're going to learn or, or, or talk a little bit about later in chapter 8, how all creation groans, how we groan, how Paul and the first believers in Christ Jesus were groaning, and even the Holy Spirit groans on our behalf. The Holy Spirit within Paul says, Paul, you belong to Christ. And Christ will set you free from the law of sin and death. And so Paul is like, verse 25, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. He affirms this notion, Galatians 5, 17. He says, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. And the spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. Do you see the warfare? They do not get along. They are contrary to one another. They are in conflict with each other so that you are not to do whatever you want. The things that you want to do that are good, we find that, that, that we struggle with them. And in a season like this, oh, we need some hope. Like Paul, we feel wretched, we feel drained and tired, and we're looking for hope, amen? And so he starts off Romans chapter 8 with, there is hope. There is now because we are saved by Christ Jesus, no condemnation. I got to tell you, this is good news. I read a quote uh, by Martin Luther. Uh, let me read that to you. I found this uh, a couple of days back. The Holy Spirit assures us that we are God's children. Amen. No matter how furiously <laughs> sin may rage within us, so long as we follow the Spirit and struggle against sin, in order to kill it. Martin Luther affirmed with us that that old flesh, that old person, the King James Bible said the old, the old man needs to be crucified, needs to be killed. That evil spirit that causes us to, to do the things that bring sin and death needs to be taken out back and it needs to be murdered. But we know we don't have the ability to do that. So Martin Luther affirms, struggle. Get in the fight. Have the battle. You're not doing it by yourself. You have the Holy Spirit as your guide, your strength, your support. I know that, that for some, we're like, yeah, that's good news. But you know, when you're hurting and when you're down and when you're depressed and when you need some good news, this is the good news. This is the news. The saving, transformative grace of Jesus Christ. That was his mission. That was his call. Listen to, his, listen to part of his inaugural address, address in, 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 in found in Luke 4. He, he declares his mission. Why are you here, Lord? He says, the Spirit of God is on me because he has anointed me to preach Good news to the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. That they'll see God. I'm coming to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover sight to the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of our Lord's favor. This is the gospel. This is good news. This is what we say to a world that feels it's like a jungle sometime and it makes me wonder how I keep from going under. This is the good news message to us, those who believe. Let's continue. Paul declares, Roman 8, 
verse 5. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. We are seeing this. We recognize it in culture. How many of you recognize it within yourselves? But those who live according in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on spiritual desires, have their minds set on spiritual divide, uh, desires. The mind that governed Governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. Baby, you're going to have to watch my time and don't let a brother go over too much. Okay. Should Amen. This is a really big deal. And, and, and it's so poignant. We see this. If you pay attention to news or if you see what's going on in your own environments, we see this. And so we groan, desiring for things to be better. We groan, and, and creation is groaning. And have you seen the rebuke that, that, that the very natural world has been giving us? How, how the air, the environment, the land, the animals, the, the, the plant life that we were all so concerned over, we were all so just twisting and, and contorting, trying to figure out what do we do? What legislation needs to be put in place? How do we save the environment? The earth is groaning. What do we do? And nature sends us a pandemic. And for three months, we can't go outside. We can't drive. We can't, we can't, we can't do the things that we normally do in life. And what has happened, nature is correcting itself. Rob and I were at her office at Eastside Christian Church a while back, and we're heading out from the office to a car, and along comes a coyote, just kind of looking, just kind of checking out things. And he stops, looks at us, and gives the brother, and it goes on about his business. The earth is correcting itself. We, as God's people, should have been leading out on this. And so we groan, that inner fighting in us. So we groan. We see the difficulties, but we also see glimpses of glory. I think most people could say, yeah, I, I believe in hell. I'm not sure about heaven. And they say that because they can see hell today. So many people are catching hell today. They need glimpses of glory in these places of utter darkness. We need to be telling people that heaven is real. We know heaven is real because Christ lives within us. And we are heavenly kingdom people our minds are what did paul say set on things above showing our compassion little glimpse of heaven mourning with those who mourn and i've been mourning so much that my heart hurts with one another people calling mike how are you doing how are things what, how, how can i pray for you wow what is going on we are heavenly minded our minds are set on jesus and we are kingdom people we are about the kingdom of god the kingdom that christ jesus told his disciples when you pray ask the father who is the ruler of the kingdom of heaven that his rule would reign here on earth right we say your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven share those glimpses of glory while we groan, we don't groan without hope. In fact, our groaning is with hope. We see the, even the earth itself is groaning, but we see glimpses of hope as the environment begins to correct itself. Amazing. There are glimpses of hope. This is what 2 Corinthians 5 says. He has committed us to the message of reconciliation. I wish I could park here. Don't got the time. Verse 20, 2 Corinthians 5, 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. And I would sure love to impress that on all of us. I am an ambassador of a heavenly kingdom. I am an ambassador. I represent the rule, the reign, the sovereignty, the governance of Jesus Christ. And how do I do that? What do I do, Mike? Continuing on. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you, Paul says, the church in Corinth, on behalf 
of Christ. B, reconciled to God. I believe, and I'm going to wrap up now. I'm wrapping up, baby. I believe we are experiencing, and I know you do as well because you are kingdom-minded people, we are experiencing a Kairos moment. Not Kronos. We always, the, the, the ticking and the passing of time. This is, this is a particular opportunity. This is a God opportunity. This is a God moment for the church to jump in the fight for justice. Not because it's cool, not because it's the thing that everyone's doing, not because if, it's, if you want to be hip, if you want to be relevant, you get in this because we are kingdom-minded people. Our own leaders of the PCUSA have made a statement. Did you see that online? Let me read very quickly a portion of, his, of, of the statement. In a very real sense, this, these, are our, these are our leaders. In a very real sense, during the colossal challenges of coronavirus and accountability, that's my phone. If you hear my phone, probably a creditor or someone wanting me to buy some. People are standing up and protesting, demanding change, seeking justice. It's time to act as the Lord's church. This is our Presbyterian leadership. It is time to act as the Lord's church. What do we do? Tony Evans writes in, in a quote, it's time now for the church to be what the God, what the head of the church, Jesus Christ, called it to be, the repairer of the breach in our culture. That's what we do. And that must mean that we not just stand up against personal sin, or, but corporate sin and, and systemic sin. Going on, our PC USA leadership says, following more than a week of protests that started with the death of George Floyd at the hand of Minnesota police, on May 25th, no longer can we hide behind not being controversial. This man is the Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson II, and he says the stated, uh, he is the stated clerk of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church. Continue on, we are all caught in this quagmire now. Can't avoid it, we are all in it now. How deep is our faith, he asks. How deep is our commitment to get into places we aren't familiar with and proclaim the gospel? Come on, kingdom people. The church, he says, is called to dismantle structures that put people in poverty and pain. To not only share the gospel, but share ourselves. We should not, these are glimpses of heaven, we should not be out here being told to go back to barber shops and beauty shops when you've got a virus going on, he said. What about the people at the bottom who are struggling? Hmm, we're putting people's health, those who Christ came to save, in jeopardy in order to make a dollar. A statement that Nelson said he realizes he's making from a position of privilege. We don't have all the answers, but we have the commitment to press on with what we have. The only thing stopping us is the fear of what might happen if it doesn't work. Ever looking unto Jesus, fixing our eyes on heaven, and faithfully with groans, with hope, anticipating the full accomplishment of the work of Jesus Christ. I encourage you, I encourage all of us, I encourage my aching spirit. Be steadfast. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. It's okay to be weary. I'm not gonna front, I'm a very honest person. I am weary of this crazy fight, but I know it is a righteous fight. And I know there is work to be done on the side of goodness, justice, and the kingdom of God. And I will not, not do that good work. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Do not give up. Do not give up. We will reap a harvest if we do not give up.
We are in an unprecedented time. This is a Kairos moment. And the modern day evangelical church must act. We must seize this moment. Let's pray. Father, we know there are times when we don't know what to do. We know there are times when, when it all seems so big and so daunting and so fearful. <laughs> Give us courage. Help us look unto Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that came before him endured his suffering, endured the cross. May we be his hands and feet, the body of Christ. Teach us now to seize this Carol's moment. In your son's name, amen.